I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and get started. And then as people come in, if they come in, we can let them join in. So Brett, Chris, Nicole, <laughs> sorry. What is your first name? I can't hear you. You're muted. Patrick. Patrick. That's yeah. it. I'm sorry. That's all right. All right. <clears throat> so I'm logged in on a couple couple of devices here in case we need a whiteboard or something like that. I also have hips and a pelvis if we need that as well. And I do have some questions from uh, some other members that apparently couldn't be here. So if we need that to drive conversation, we will. Otherwise, of you three gentlemen, I guess the topic is hip mobility. This is IFAST University and welcome. And who has a question? And if everybody sits here, <laughs> or it's gonna be a short talk. I have a question, Bill. Fire away. So I have a client who was pregnant. Um, I think her child's now like nine months old. She has wonky hip stuff when she squats and deadlifts. She's like super ex um, externally rotated with her femurs and it just doesn't look comfortable. She doesn't mm -hmm. have any pain with it, but uh, she can't go that low with depth. And I've kind of regressed her from a hinge to a um, hip thrust instead of trying to focus on the deadlift for now. I'm just going back to a hinge. That looks okay. She can feel hamstrings and glutes there. But I was curious if you've had experience with ladies who were pregnant or mm -hmm. who, um, have had children and they still have some weird hip limitations or issues. Right. So, so there's a couple of things that, that you want to take into consideration here. Um, what is this her first child? That's it's her first, and she just had a miscarriage a few. Uh, like a week or two ago, but it was a super early pregnancy. So I don't think that affected much. Okay. Okay. Um, depending on how long she was pregnant the second time, however, you're going to have some hormonal stuff that, that may be involved. So the first trimester, the, the relaxin circulation is very high. And so that's the stuff that makes ligaments a little bit looser and allows more mobility in the pelvis. So just an FYI on that, that happens in the first 14 weeks of pregnancy. So again, if she just miscarried, um, depending on how long she was pregnant, that, that may uh, promote some of what you're seeing. Um, now, the thing you have to kind of consider is what orientation would her pelvis be in, especially having you know, had a baby not too long ago. And so in most cases, depending on how, how big a person she is, you're going to have a, a certain type of pelvic orientation that goes along the pregnancy. So as the baby moves forward, she has to make postural adjustments. And again, the pelvis will alter its orientation in response to changes in, in the, the body's response to gravity. So you could have an orientation that actually points the hip sockets in, in a retroverted position, which would be a little bit more posterior and a little bit more down. So hang on a second, I do have a pelvis, so I will, I will pick it up here and show you. So depending on orientation, so if, if, if nothing from a relationship standpoint changed within the, the pelvis itself, she's at least going to, to orient herself forward simply because of the, the weight shift forward. Now, in most cases, though, what, what the typical response is not to follow the weight, but to, but to actually create a, a posterior orientation or rotation in the pelvis. And so what she'll end up doing is probably doing that, where it will open a little bit. Do you know if she had a C-section or a normal delivery? I do not. I could ask, would that help? Well, it... it, it Again, so, so in this orientation, the, the, the canal that the baby has to pass through is narrower. And so, so sometimes that's one of the reasons why they have to go C-section is because there's just not enough room for the baby to come out. And so again, that might point in a certain direction and help you make a determination on what you're looking at. But if we turn it sideways, you can see that if I, if I reorient the ilium, so if I widen the ilium in response to the load, 
I actually reorient the hip socket. You see how it turns down and back a little bit? So that's a retroverted position of the hip socket. And so if the socket's pointing in that direction, it stands to reason that the, the more, more comfortable position uh, for that hip to rest in would be external rotation because it, the, that is moving the, the socket into that position. So that might be one of the reasons why you're seeing the, the, the patterning during a squat. And again, we're, we're, we're guessing right now, we're not really sure. But again, a possibility. Um, secondly, it, it may also limit motion uh, because of the change in concentric to eccentric orientation of the surrounding musculature. So as I, as I reorient this pelvis forward, I'm going to pick up uh, muscle activity, concentric muscle activity in the front of the hip. I can get eccentric orientation in some of the musculature that's coming up that attaches to the, to the, to the ischial tuberosity like hamstrings and such. Um, I can get a reorientation of glute max in the sagittal plane, and I can get reorientation of external rotators as well. So when she tries to sit down, those external rotators might be very concentrically oriented, and that's not gonna let her squat. It's gonna, gonna let her sit comfortably. She's not gonna be able to bend forward comfortably, or she'll, she'll have a limitation there, simply because of all this, this concentric muscle activity that would have to allow the pelvis to open and widen to allow her to bend and squat. So again, you're gonna to have to make a determination on that. Hip internal and external rotation measures will give you a clue. Um, and again, depending on how quickly she bounced back from being pregnant into activity, you'll see rib cage orientation that may also be an influence. So if, if her rib cage widened during the pregnancy, that can alter the, the entire orientation where the whole pelvis, so I could have this, this appearance and an orientation forward, and that's a lot of muscle activity that's going to prevent uh, more hip flexion, especially in a squatting type of pattern. So, you know, in that regard, you're just going to have to select an alternative method or you're gonna to have to determine what position she's in and then give her some form of activity that will reduce this concentric orientation of the musculature to allow it to lengthen and then allow her to sort of regain hip mobility. So if she doesn't have hip internal rotation, then you know she's got a lot of concentric activity in the external rotators. And so you wanna promote something that will help reorient the pelvis posteriorly. So, that, so that as the ilium rotates posteriorly, it should allow some of that concentric orientation um, to, to reorient to eccentric, and then that should help restore some of that internal rotation in the hip. Now, you mentioned a hip thrust. <clears throat> Let me caution you just a little bit. If she is in, and I'm exaggerating this for effect, if she's in this orientation, so it's wide at, at the top and narrow at the bottom, and you start driving a hip thrust, you, you could be actually emphasizing that position. You could be making it harder for her to get out of that position because the concentric activity of a hip thrust duplicates the concentric activity of that position. So, so be aware of that, okay? Does that help you at all? Yes, it does. Do you, so that was, the hip thrust was to replace the deadlift, the kettlebell deadlift. And mm -hmm. I've been, I started with goblet squats and then I changed it to like a uh, cable reaching squats. Uh -huh. So she comes down and that looks a lot better. Right. Um, so I'm trying to figure out something to like get a hinge to practice with her. But um, do you have any suggestions for starting a hinge motion with her? So can she get on all fours? Yep. Okay, so you just start rocking her backwards from her all fours position, and then that te that teaches her the the pattern at the hip joint, and then you can start to uh, evolve the 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 rib cage and spine position that you would want for hinging as well. So as she learns to sit back, then you just decide how much hip motion you want, what orientation of the of the rib cage and spine, and then monitor, coach, cue and then just evolve it from there. Because once she can, she can do that, then you can start to bring her up, right? So you're just teaching her how to manage gravity just like her, her baby does, right? And so that's an easy way 
to, to take somebody that may not have an effective strategy in regards to control of, of her, her pelvis relative to her rib cage. So you teach her how to move that as a, as a relatively stable structure, which is typically what you want in a hinging motion, right? And, and then, um, like I said, bring her up to her feet from there. And then you can do an unweighted hinge, and then you can progress her to some kind of lightly loaded deadlift patterning or, or however you want to work that. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Corey Hack, how you doing, man? Oh, how's it going? It is going well. It's going well. Do you have any questions? Um, I do. Okay, you got a lot of background noise, dude. Just yeah, I'm at the that. gym right now. Um, okay. I don't really know where to go to make it quiet. That's okay. That's okay. If, if you got a question, go ahead and ask it, and then and then just mute, and then we'll figure this out. Okay. Um. So one of my clients' squat looks awesome when I elevate his heels, mm -hmm. and then as soon as I take the elevation away, just everything kind of falls apart. Right. More just like kind of can't sit back into his hips, and it's just a lot of like spinal flexion i guess as opposed to like the moving back so just kind of mm -hmm. how do you kind of navigate going from heels elevated to just normal feet on the ground well so so you're you're using a, a compensatory strategy to, to create a squat right and so um what it may be is that by by dropping these heels down number one maybe there's a, a joint limitation in that regard. So you might make sure you got to clear the hip, you got to clear the knee, and you got to clear the ankle for, for normal range of motion. Now, if he can't manage center of gravity above his feet, then that can also drive an active limitation. So even if somebody has normal passive range of motion, when they have to behave against gravity, everything sort of changes in regards to what strategy they're going to be able to use. A lot of times though, if you create an anterior load, you'll be able to keep their heels down. So something like a plate squat or a reaching squat of some kind. And then you can move that towards a regular goblet squat where the, the anterior load is moving closer and closer to their center of gravity. That eventually becomes a front squat and so on. Um, there are situations where um, because of the, the shape of the subtalar joint in some people's ankles, they don't have a whole lot of dorsiflexion that would allow them to, to squat under normal circumstances. And so the heels elevated thing uh, is, is really common. That's why you see a lot of people using weightlifting shoes because they've got the heel already elevated and then they can actually sit down and do a relatively pretty squat or they can perform their weightlifting movements that demand the deeper uh, squat patterning, right? So, um, clear, clear the joints and then try to develop a strategy that allows them to shift posteriorly. So you put the, the load anterior, the reaching forward, and then see what happens from there. And like I said, it, it may just be this progressive patterning where they're going to learn how to manage their center of gravity with their heels on the ground. Because again, it, it, it Stands the reason if they do a pre-squat, it's probably not going to be a, a true hip-related thing. It's probably going to be more of a, a strategy associated with their center of gravity. That makes sense because, like, yeah. we've, I've cleared or we've kind of cleared a good amount of the table stuff, but then just as soon as you bring gravity back into the equation, things kind of get a little bit messy. It's it and and, and it, it's very very common to to see that because again, you have to manage. A lot of stuff. There's there's internal forces to manage. There's airflow. Uh, how you're producing intra-abdominal pressure. How you're pushing pressure up from from the bottom of the pelvis. What strategy they're using there. So again, if if they stand up and and they use a strategy that that alters the 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 position of the bottom of the pelvis alters the muscle activity there. Now you're gonna have somebody that can't sit down simply because they're pushing uh, or they're, they're, they're using like a, a high tension strategy um, that doesn't allow the pelvis to move enough to, to let them sit down. So again, there's in a lot of this stuff, you, like I said, if you just play with center of gravity a little bit, you'll, you'll tend to, to sort of find a way to start. And then a lot of times you just give them enough you know, time in between training cycles 
So that, you know, maybe it's like four weeks with a plate squat and then four weeks with a goblet squat and four weeks with a double kettlebell front. And then eventually you can get them to a nice pretty squat. And then sometimes you can't, and then you just have to, to make the accommodation. Makes sense. Yeah. And another kind of question off that. So he's a very wide and personal angle. Um, and it, I don't get too much change with that. Like he's an older person. Um, and most things he does is just a ton of hamstrings, has trouble shifting his center of gravity forward and to get like quads and stuff. So is that kind of play, like is, are they gonna have a harder time with something like a squat based on that description? Right, so, so in, in that typical scenario, what you're gonna have is somebody that's very, very wide relative to how deep they are front to back. Am I correct? So he's kind of like a wide guy, right? And so one of the things that you actually need to sit down is you need to be able to expand the thorax anterior to posterior. And if you can't do that, then the center of gravity continues to shift forward. And so he's gonna run out of room very, very quickly. So you're gonna see that, that maybe you lay him on the table and he's got normal hip flexion, but when he stands up, because of the, the reorientation of the thorax on top of the, of the pelvis, the pelvis is going to orient itself forward and you're going to run out of hip flexion very, very quickly. And then if the center of gravity goes further forward, then you lose ankle motion very quickly. So if you lose hip and ankle motion very, very quickly, chances are you get a very, very shallow squat. So again, the, I wouldn't change the, the recommended strategy. I would still try to get him to reach forward and offset with, with some load that he can handle and see if that doesn't get you a better squat. Makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Jim, there's something going on. Are you there, Jim? I'm here, Bill, but I have lots of background noise. How are okay. you? I'm good. I'm good. Good to hear you. Good to hear you too, man. You got a question or anything, brother? Or are you just hanging out? I'm just hanging out, and I'll try not to hijack it this time. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hijack it. You just redirected. it. There you go. That's all right. Um, okay. Does anybody want to know? So this is from Mario, but does anybody want to know how you go about determining someone's optimal squat or deadlift stance? Maybe this is Chris. Does that help you, brother? Say that question one more time. Okay. I got braces on, so it's hard for me to speak clearly. So how do you go about determining someone's optimal squat or deadlift stance? Um, there's no rules, first and foremost. You have to determine what you want it to look like. So you have this picture in your head that you said that you call a squat, and then within certain variations, you have an acceptable level of performance. There's really no rule. Um, if we go back to Corey's question about the heels elevated thing, and then we kind of use it in conjunction, um, Chris, with your previous question, when you have somebody that, that doesn't have what you would consider this pretty ideal squat that you're seeking, sometimes you can alter foot, foot position. So a wider stance in some cases will allow some people to keep their heels down, but maybe it does affect their depth. And, and it, I'm okay with you starting people just about anywhere that you deem safe. And so a lot of times, if I am just starting someone out, I put a box behind them and I tell them to sit down and I tell them to stand up. And people tend to put their feet where they can to perform whatever squat that they can perform. And that might be the best way to start. So they used to call it potty squatting, where you just sit down as if you're getting up off the toilet. But if you start somebody from a seated position and have them stand up, they tend to put their feet where they need to, to perform a squat. And so you would start there. If you don't like that stance, but you're okay with them starting there, then you start to make the adjustments over time. So because there's not a right or a wrong necessarily, you, again, use that picture that you have in your head and you work them towards that. So again, there are a number of ways that I can manipulate the center of gravity that will allow me to change that foot position, but there's nothing wrong with starting out people a little bit wider than you normally would. There's nothing wrong with, with starting people you know, with their toes pointed out a little bit more than you normally would, as long as your intent is, is this is a progression. This is a, a, 
merely a moment in time and we're going to work towards something else. So we, we talk about minimum viable performance. So if I am trying to improve the performance of any aspect, in this case a squat or a deadlift, in regards to, to stance, I'll just start them wherever I can and just say, okay, this is where we are today. And then I know where we want to go. And then I try to make those adjustments along the way. So a lot of times I think people tend to overcoach a little bit. And all you do is add to the frustration of the client because they're no longer successful. And you're constantly telling them, no, you need to do it this way. You need to do it this way. Sometimes it's just perfectly fine to say, you know what, that was good enough for today. And we'll just keep working on it because what they need to do is learn how to control their center of gravity. They need to learn how to access their mobility. And so that's why being a good coach means sometimes you just shut up and you just let people do some things as long as they're within this safe and, and adequate range that, that you perceive and, and work from where they are. So I don't really have like a set way that I would determine what is optimal in regards to a, a squat or a deadlift, I just kind of let people do something and then start to make the adjustments there. So I hope that answers Mario's question and helps you guys out as well. I have a question off of that. Fire away. So as you said, it, you'll start people kind of where they're most comfortable and then you, init you eventually want to kind of progress them to what you think's a better position, even though you don't know what optimal is and there's not optimal. Right. So let's say like they start a little bit wider and toes a little bit like more flared out than you would like. How do mm -hmm. we know that that's a bad position to not a bad position, but why can't we keep them there? Well, I, maybe you can. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, that there's a right or a wrong. I'm saying that you're, you're the, you get to be the coach, right? So you get to determine what you want as an outcome in regards to what the, the client is capable of doing, desires to do, et cetera. So, so that's, that's your call entirely. What I would hope would be the, the long-term goal is to have the ability to do it several different ways versus seeking out a singular optimal because I don't think there is one. So for instance, you're, your squat pattern with a, with a bar across the front of your shoulders should be different than the squat pattern if you put it behind your neck, right? If I hold a kettlebell out at arm's length, I'm going to squat differently than I hold the kettlebell close to me in, in, a, in like a goblet squat position. So again, the, the demands of the activity will determine what this person uh, is capable of in regards to optimal at that moment in time with the understanding that there's probably not one singular and I just need to make sure that I have enough variability built into their system because variability is rep more representative of health versus seeking out one optimal, right? We, we don't want to have one, one, one pattern because again, if I move the load, I change the task or I've altered the environment, however you want to per perceive that. And therefore the appearance of the activity should change. I have a kind of a question about that. Sure. So assuming you don't have access to table tests, you don't know anything about them, you're just seeing them squat for the first time, mm -hmm. how they decide to self-organize and kind of perform the squat, could mm -hmm. that be some insight into like their compensatory strategies that they use and sort of stuff you can't or would be able to see on the table but don't have access to at the moment? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. The, the, the thing that I would say, Corey, is that, is that what you're going to use with a complex movement, uh, like any complex movement, so a squat or a deadlift or, or anything that involves multiple joints moving at the same time, especially against gravity, um, you, you're not going to be able to maybe answer all the why questions, but you do have a comparator to play with. So if, if I did no tape, I don't need table tests to, to take somebody into the gym and train something. I can just say, do this, see what happens. And then I alter um, either through a, a cue or I change the load or I change the position. And then I just see what happens. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think, I think people get way too carried away when you're, when you're taking somebody into the gym that they have to have, you know, all these umpteen table tests cleared, you know, to whatever their, their considered normal is before you can take somebody out and exercise. And that's just not even remotely close to true, right? Again, if we, if we always consider the, the person 
as, as their, their minimum viable performance, right? So here's how you perform today. And if we can move people closer and closer to whatever we perceive as, as being better or, or ideal under a specific context or circumstance, then, then I'm totally okay with that. I don't expect things to ever be perfect for anybody and I expect them to evolve. There's not one right way. There are many. And again, we have to appreciate that in people. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I forgot I was going to say. Uh-oh. That should only happen when you're my age, dude. It's not good. I'm getting older. All right. Let me see if I got another question hanging here. Um, hmm. So what are your top two or three resets that you find yourself using with your individuals and groups? I have no idea. Um, to be totally uh, frank. Um, I try not to have to use those if I don't have to. If I can work these things into activities, if I can move people and again, we just using like a warm-up activity or something along those lines versus having to do some sort of structured rehab exercise to get people to, to regain their mobility. If I can just do it through uh, some sequence of activities, maybe I do take them to the floor, maybe we do something in all fours, and we're, we're regaining the ability to manage the pressures and, and the forces inside the body that way. Some people can't uh, posteriorly rotate their pelvis. They can't expand the posterior rib cage. So there's many ways that, that you can achieve those things without having to do some sort of structured, structured activity. Um, it does help when you can manipulate respiration to some degree because that is one of the, the uh, components of internal pressures that we do have to manage. So um, again, using different positions, um, the, the, uh, rolling patterns that were promoted years and years ago are actually a way to actually manipulate some of those pressures. So I'm okay with that. Arm bar progressions are really nice um, to, to teach people how to reach forward and to uh, start to control the, the internal pressures. Uh, and again, you, using respiration as a complement allows you to, to manipulate those things and allows you to access greater ranges of motion. Most people uh, are limited in hip mobility because they, they can't alter position sufficiently um, around the, uh, uh, in regards to the, the joint position to reorient the muscles from concentric, eccentric or eccentric to concentric. And so that's where those limitations tend to rest. It is, it is rare that you would see somebody with a, a true uh, altered joint structure that would limit someone's capacity to access certain hip motions. Now there are structural changes there, you know, in regards to the depth of the hip socket or the orientation of the hip socket as a bony position, not just a, a mobility based position, but they are, they, in, at least in my experience over 28 years, there are a very small percentage of those people that you cannot manipulate. In, in regards to changing those positions. So, so I try not to um, default to, to rehab exercises in, in the fitness realm. We went through that phase. Um, I think we're, we're getting well past that and we're using other forms, like just putting someone in a half kneeling position, you know, your chops and your lift patterns um, work just as well as those other activities. And like I said, if you can, if you can include an element of respiration, you'll find that, that you're able to access a lot more mobility in a lot of these people without having to flop them on their backs and, and uh, um, treat them like they're broken. Because again, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get away with those, get away from those things. Um, when, these, when the people come in and they're much more satisfied in regards to their, uh, their performance, they feel much more successful when they can be more active. And so again, if you can just build those things into the warm up versus you know, having the, uh, the uh, structured rehab activities, I think it works out a lot better. So I hope that answers Mario's other question. And anybody else? I guess I have a question based off the structure comment. <clears throat> sure. So I have a client who 
seems to sit like Annie Bird, right? It has a bunch of internal rotation. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of external rotation. Okay. Pretty even side to side. Um, but he starts to get like a right hamstring pull when he's running. So like, is he shifted? But everything seems to be pretty status quo right to left. Um, you know, he's flat back, right? Wide and for certain angles. So okay. from the front, he looks wide. But what do you start to look at there? Do you, you know, he's, is he posterior pelvic tilted already because he's antiverted? Is there already that pelvic tilt or what? <laughs> okay. So people with crazy internal rotation of the hip, yeah. limited external rotation of the hip, tend to have a problem above the pelvis that is okay. orienting the pelvis forward. So let me let me show you with my little pelvis here. So if if I just if I just orient the pelvis forward, so I'm not I'm not altering the relationship between the ilium and the sacrum at all. So I'm just going to orient it forward. So so that would mean that the infrapubic angle is, is still wide, right? And so if they have any respiratory uh, uh, variability issues where, they, where they, they don't have the ability to adduct the hip or whatever, then chances are the whole pelvis is oriented forward. So what happens when I, when I orient the pelvis forward is I actually gain a lot of hip internal rotation. So the normal mechanics of the hip as the ilium rotates forward is to increase internal rotation um, abduction and of course flexion of the hip. Okay, that would be that would be a normal pattern associated with that movement of the of the pelvis. So what can happen is is I gain that internal rotation, um, and then because of the anterior orientation of the of the pelvis, the, there's muscles on the on the front half of the pelvis that can internally rotate the hip. Well, they pick up concentric orientation. So I lose the ability to externally rotate and I have this crazy internal rotation. So I would look up here and above. So you mentioned a flat back. So if yeah. somebody's, if, yeah, so if somebody's got a wide infrasternal angle, the axial skeleton tends to be in an exhaled position and the wide infrasternal angle is a compensatory strategy to breathe in. And again, that, that will present as a structural thing because most people, are like, if you look at like a shorter torso to longer leg length concept, those people tend to be a little bit wider. And then there's, and there's other relationships. But again, yeah. with, with, with the wide ISA and the flat back, you've got an exhaled axial skeleton. So, so what I would do, um, one, is you got to start thinking about, I've got a lot of concentric muscle activity above the pelvis. So when you try to reorient the position of the axial skeleton, um, I would try to reverse the pelvis and start to expand that, that upper back area, the, so, the, so the, the posterior upper thorax, getting um, expansion there. Um, again, so your reaching activities, your overhead activities, um, using an inhalation um, will, um, that was my dog, by the way, um, will provide you uh, uh, the whole reorientation of the pelvis, and then you recheck your your hips and see if you don't if you don't start to see the difference. So okay. again, you're just picking up. Con it sounds like you're picking up concentric um, activity on the on the front half of the pelvis. So. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's really confounding because you don't expect to see any internal rotation on those wide wide infrasternal angles, and when you do see it, it's it's usually higher. It's not in the okay. pelvis itself. Yeah. That's a good question because it happens a lot and people get confused because it doesn't really fit, you know, what you would typically yeah. see. Yeah, I was a little thrown off by it. So. Yeah, yeah. Go upstairs. That's what I would do. All right. Yeah. I have a question based off the running that was just mentioned. Okay. So are you familiar with, uh, I think it's Greg Lehman or Lehman, the PT, talks a lot about like, um, I know, I know, I know of him. Yeah. He's okay. So I know he, he's talked a lot about pain science and mm -hmm. um, he mentions a lot about running and how once you become into more like cyclical or endurance longer, like low level activity, the um, spectrum of form or like biomechanics becomes larger um, as you go from like the left side would be like a one rep max squat to running like a marathon. Like you can get away with more um, of these discrepancies with longer duration. 
What are your thoughts about whether or not you agree with that or you still think like position and um, like the pelvis and rib cage still plays a huge role with those longer type activities? Well, you, you still have to manage position and, and internal forces. There's, there's, I mean, you have external forces, you have internal forces. And then the question that becomes is, is what, what type of structure do you bring to the table? So there's certain people that, that make good runners. They tend to be a little bit more, more linear in structure. They tend to be more built like a piston versus, you know, I would never take somebody that, that's built like a linebacker and, and expect them to become a good distance runner. So I wonder if there's an element of self-selection there. When I get good at it, it just turns out that structurally I'm okay with that. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to comment on, on anything that Greg says because I just don't know him, nor have I read anything that you're talking about in, in that regard. Um, what there may be associated with somebody that is attracted to that type of activity is that they may inherently have greater variability within their system. Whereas when I am performing a, a strength oriented type of program where, where that is my goal is to maximize my strength, I actually need to reduce my variability a great deal, a great deal to be successful. So that's why you tend to see the, you know, some of the, your better power lifters that you'll, you'll meet, not the best movers, great squatters, great deadlifters, great bench pressers, but maybe not the greatest movers in the world. And so again, there might be an element of, of selection there. There may be an element of, okay, just the activity that I've chosen allows me to have greater variability. If my aerobic capacity is higher, I tend to have better variability than somebody that is, that is anaerobically trained. So there's a lot of elements that, that play into this. Um, but again, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, counter anything that, that, that Greg has said. Um, and, you know, it might be his experience and that's what he's talking about. So again, I don't, I don't have like a, a research at the tip of my tongue that would support any of that. But again, just looking at the elements of and influences of training, how the nervous system behaves under certain circumstances, that might be the case that allows that to happen. Anybody else? I have another question. Fire away, Corey. So one of my friends, powerlifter, um, hard shift, right knee pain, hard shift to the right when he squats. Mm -hmm. So he cleared a lot of the stuff, but under under a lot of load, obviously, he still gets that shift. Uh -huh. This is kind of, I guess, like Bashian. He talks about like fatigue. So can you use fatigue like at the end of a workout to sort of um, – groove the squat pattern in a way so like at the end of a workout if he's every time he back squats he shifts to the right if we lower the load but he's already fatigued his system is kind of thinks it's heavier weight and he doesn't shift can we kind of use it as a method maybe yes, to, uh, maybe i mean if he's successful right um and, and again if it's if it's a purely technical problem then I think that you, you may have a viable strategy there. Now, if it's related to a certain threshold of force that's required, then maybe not. And now you might have to consider another strategy, okay? So, so let's talk about right shift in a, in a squat. So do you recall talking about that when you were with, with the fine folks at IFAST? I do. Okay. So the, so the right shift is a compensatory strategy, right? That, uh, again, if he cannot manage it at a certain threshold of load, he will continue to, to try to use that, right? So maybe it's a matter of, okay, let's bring the weight back. Let's find out where you are capable of, of squatting wherever we say is ideal, and then we start to reload over time. That would be the simplest way to do it, right? Maybe um, it is a, uh, a positional strategy that, that he uses 
because again, he's not supporting load. So maybe it has nothing to do with the squat itself and it has to do with his ability to control the position of the axial skeleton, his ability to manage the, the internal pressures inside the axial skeleton, right? So, you know, one of the things that really quick tricks is you put a belt on somebody and then you watch them squat with the belt and you compare it to them squatting without the belt at that threshold level. And a lot of times it changes dramatically. And, and so then you kind of know, it's like, okay, I have this, this inability to control the internal forces as well when I reach a certain load and that's what promotes the, the, the right shift. So um, again, what, what the fix is, is gonna be a, one of unfortunate, it depends thing, but I would just have like, a, a just go through a strategy and say, okay, let's take you to threshold level. It's like, what weight can you squat where we would say that this is an okay looking squat without the compensatory strategy and then start to build. If it comes back right away, then you're gonna to have to look elsewhere, right? So maybe it's the way I position my upper thorax under the load at a certain weight. And so maybe I don't even need to, to worry about the squat right now. Maybe I need to be you know, worried about changing the shape of that upper thorax through you know, the strength training through the pressure management strategies, through reaching activities, through pulling activities. So again, I can't tell you exactly which one that would be without, without, you know, looking this, at this person. But, but again, it's like you can slowly eliminate things if you just pay attention to what you're actually doing at the time. Um, but yeah, the simplest way to go is just like taking back down to below that. Is it pretty? Okay. Let's just add a little bit of weight at a time. You know, there's nothing wrong with the trial and error concept. People want to think that, oh, you have, you have, if this happens, then this is the strategy that you'll use. And it's like, it's, unfortunately, we're just not that simple. Well, it's interesting because we did a bunch of like lower level stuff to kind of get the shift to the left. Uh -huh. Like just table test wise, there's a ton of range of motion, like kind of everywhere, like right. lower body. And right. doing too much to get the shift to the left, you would start shifting to the left when he squatted. Uh -huh. So it was kind of like finding that middle ground between right, right. finding whatever works we can squat for the day. Sometimes it's a simple cue. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a position of load. Sometimes it's a position of stance. Sometimes it it's, has nothing to do with the activity in question, right? And, and again, but, but you can eliminate those strategies um, just through simple trial and error and using your, your reasoning right? As to, okay, what is actually happening here? So if I got a guy that if you do flop him on a table and you move him around, you go, wow, he moves really, really well. Okay. Now he's having trouble managing the internal and external forces, right? So I got gravity, I got external load, and then I got the stuff that's going on inside that I all have to control. Right? It's like a lot of just kind of considering all the factors, not just what yeah. it looks like on the table and what the squat yeah. looked like that one day. Right. And, and, and be simple first, right? Just what's the easiest thing I could possibly do? Like, hey, uh, try this instead of that. There you go. And then you work, you, you try to get more complex from there. Um, but yeah, don't, don't overcomplicate it until you have to. Hey, Bill, if I could kind of add something. Of course. Um, back in the, uh, the days when I was the king of the high threshold strategy, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, I was working out at your place and Eric Otter was watching me squat. And of course I was the, you know, king of the right stance. And uh, he had me just slightly turn my right foot in just a little bit and then had me focus on driving off my right leg. Mm -hmm. And that, that did it for me. So I, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. And, you know, also you helping me, you know, understand circumferential expansion definitely help me with that but right. that might be something that he might want to try just to see because i'll have people that come in you know they want me to work with them one time and fix their squat and i see a lot of that right shift yep. and i kind of have them you know give them a couple different things to do to learn teach them how to you know brace properly but that driving like turning that foot in and driving off that right foot really yeah. seems to clean a lot of that up right so so the 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 Typical right shift is a, a right internal rotation adduction of the hip. So 
the, the strategy to come out of that would be to uh, avoid that, that motion as you sit down into a squat. So the way you would do that would be to, to externally rotate the hip, right? So the strategy that, that you were given by Eric basically produces that. So if you bring your foot in a little bit and you push off of that foot a little bit, then you tend to um, uh, promote external rotation as you sit down versus allowing the internal rotation to happen. Yeah, so it was a really simple thing that, yeah. uh, that yeah. he was able to help me with. So, yeah. And a lot of times but, it is that simple. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? I have another question. Of course you do, Chris. So <laughs> it's, uh, Did Lance put you up to this? No, I'm but... Kidding. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> um, so bouncing off that right hip shift, I have an older female client who... Mm -hmm. She is great with deadlifting. She's extremely strong with deadlifts. She's progressed very quickly over these past mm -hmm. two months. Mm -hmm. Comfortable for her, et cetera. She is having trouble with squats. Like it's such a harder um, movement. She's just so much weaker in it. Like we started um, like plate reaching, progressed mm -hmm. to cable reach. And then now we're at like 10, 15 pound goblet squats to a box. Nice. And she has that same thing where she her right glute will tap the like the bench first yep. and she, she's she's mindful of it and it's a minor like an like a half inch where it taps first and i just don't know if i need to correct it because it, it was happening even during like the the plate reach and she's had it this whole time mm -hmm. so and mm -hmm. she doesn't have that situation when she hinges so i was curious right. to hear your opinion whether or not that's something to worry about or to even focus on <clears throat> so so whether it's something you worry about is your call entirely you get to see her uh, actually move right so i will give you credit for that um but actually the cue that jim just brought up is a very very common cue that we can use so so what's happening is that she's internally internally rotating more on the right side than she is on the left side as she sits down and so what happens is you have um a, a reduced eccentric strategy on the left that allows the, the back of the hip to to lengthen and allow her to sit back so what so it looks like her right hip is sitting a little bit lower as she squats right and so if you get a little bit more concentric activity on the right hip as she sits down then maybe that's enough and to, to even it out maybe you need to give her um like a, a a right knee down half kneeling activity that that um, um, allows her to increase the ability of that left hip to uh, lengthen. So, so to eccentrically orient the posterior left hip, you can put her in, in right knee down half kneeling activities and then squat her and see if that doesn't help. Because that's an easy way to, to, to access left hip internal rotation. Okay. So again, there's, there's multiple strategies here. Um, and it may just be, you just do the exercise in a little bit different sequence. You get a little bit different muscle activity um, in, the, in the left hip to, to right hip. And then that allows you to um, even out the squat if you think it's that big a deal, right? Because a squat is not a hinge. So, so right. they aren't there. One is, one is a, a loading pattern and one is a propulsive pattern. And so, so they shouldn't have the same muscle activity. So, um, if she doesn't have a shift in a hinge, then chances are you're getting the muscle activity on the right side when she hinges and you're not getting it um, when she squats. And so you might need to, to teach her a new strategy on the left side. Did Jim say bringing in the foot or pointing the toe in a little bit more? So it, it, it would depend on what you're seeing. And so, um, but the, the goal would be to uh, place, um, a, so if you think about a tripod foot, is, have you guys talked about that? Okay. So if you load the, the, the medial aspect of a tripod foot a little bit more aggressively, um, that's going to externally rotate up the chain, right? Up the lower extremity and, and may provide you an element of that. So maybe it's just a matter of you cueing the, the 
the sensation on the bottom of the foot or the, or the foot position, and maybe that cleans up everything that you want, right? Again, without having to chase another exercise, you just give it a, a, a cue. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then maybe you need the ability to internally rotate the left hip. And then I would say, let's go to the half kneeling strategy and, and, and that'll probably, you know, allow you to gain what you're looking for there. Does it matter what activity to do during half kneeling or just the position? Yeah, it does help. Um, but, you know, if you do like a, uh, uh, a right knee down half kneeling cable press with an exaggerated reach, um, a lot of times, so to, to, to create the exaggerated reach, you have to internally rotate the left hip. I mean, so it's, again, it's, it's again, you're chasing um, a, a change in mobility, but using a nice gym exercise that feels like they're still working out. And so I don't have to do any funky mobility stuff. I can just build it right into the program. So um, you do a chop across the body that way. Sometimes you can use, you know, some form of, of stabilized activity. Some people can do um, a, uh, a kettlebell chop and lift or a halo or something. A lot of times it's just a matter of positioning the pelvis and, and challenging them to hold the position. And if they hold it effectively, you get the muscle activity that you're seeking, right? Kind of going off that. So mm -hmm. say we give them the turn your foot in cue and it works. Mm -hmm. How can such a small like cue or change create such like a huge influence. So you're literally changing how you manage internal external forces and stuff like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? So, so welcome to the world of complexity. So, so you, I know you have read about this, right? So we can have a little chat about, about how this, this works, right? So one of the things that we know about complex systems is a very small influence can have a, a very, high magnitude change, or a very high magnitude influence could have a very small change or no change, right? And so this, is, this can be one of those cases where literally this is the limiting factor, and all I need to do is make this one tiny adjustment, and now I can stack a bunch of weight on top of that axial skeleton, whereas that little leak, that little power drain, if you will, um, was just enough to just totally drop the threshold of capability. So, so this is just one of those things about being a complex system, but um, that I think that, you know, you keep this strategy as simple as possible for the greatest influence. And then you sort of work up from there. I think that's the easiest way to do what we do, especially with, with the fitness related clients. Um, I don't think we have to get too wild and crazy. I don't think we have to turn them into um, rehab clients. Um, you know, we don't have to treat them like they're broken. It's just like, okay, this is what you're capable of. And again, we're going back to this minimal viable performance. It's like, okay, how good can you be today? You know, I, if, if my goal is to squat 300 pounds and I can only squat 200 pounds, I, I don't try to coach somebody into a 300 pound squat knowing full well they don't have the capabilities. I develop those capabilities over time. Why is movement any different from any of those other, other abilities that we're chasing in the gym, whether it be endurance or strength or power or whatever you want to call it? You know, and I think that sometimes we get a little carried away and we make it harder than it needs to be. It's funny you say that because one of my clients was deadlifting the other day and just didn't look good. And I literally just gave him a compliment. It's like, oh, like looks like you're working really hard or something. And everything just like cleaned up. Didn't yeah. coach him, didn't do anything. So is that could be just like one of the small influences, just change everything. So so uncertainty drives a certain certain physical pattern, right? And you gave him um, a reinforcement and you changed his state. You know, who knows what happened, right? We can sit here and have a great discussion over drinks of, and, and theorize about all the amazing aspects of the brain um, and not knowing anything about what happened. We just know that, okay, that was good. So next time this guy comes in, I kind of know how I need to interact to, to get a more favorable outcome, you know? And I'm okay with that. 
Very cool. All right, any more questions? We got time for one short one if you guys want to throw one out there. If not, then I think Lance will be reasonably satisfied with the outcome having not been here. This might be, this might be the best one we've ever had. What do you guys think? I, I just had to say that because Lance isn't here and he's recording from afar. I have one more question. I don't know if it's going to be a quick answer though. So. Oh, I can make it quick too. Trust me. Okay. So I have a guy who he, I don't know his background, but he's uh, 34. 435 and he still have his mom and I think he had some like prior trauma and mm -hmm. we've never talked about it but he's just a very like rigid human overall mm -hmm. um just the way he moves very stiff mm -hmm. and he loves med ball slams and he does them really well like positioning and everything and mm -hmm. he almost like smiles every time he does it and it's like kind of a release for him right and at the yeah, and at the end of the slam, he gets into like a really good hinge position. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed that. And when I had started teaching him deadlifts, it becomes so stiff. He goes back to the rigid, stiff position. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was interesting because like a med ball slam is very explosive, very, sure. um, I would think it would be the opposite. Like it seems like a less safe position, um, like something that fast. Mm -hmm. But for him, like it's such a, like, as you said, what did you say? Um, cathartic position or mm -hmm. feeling? Well, the activity is cathartic, right? So maybe, yeah. maybe he does have some, I mean, and again, I'm not a psychologist. Don't claim to be one, not a neurologist, not a neuroscientist, you know, so we're, we're grasping at straws here in regards to what, what's really going on. And, you know, if we don't know, what to do, then, you know, we, we can't determine what influences we have here. All you can go with is appearances, right? And so, maybe you need sort of like a middle ground strategy that's something that's that's between this this dynamic activity that he's really good at and one let him know that he's really good at it so now we're back to the Corey Heck strategy of just giving a compliment and watching a perfect deadlift right um but but in, in all seriousness maybe you start with a deadlift pattern with the, with the med ball in his hands, if, if he's able to execute that. So you give him some familiarity in that regard. Um, potentially you get the patterning that you like, and then maybe you start to create that, that transition into, you know, some other form of, of, of deadlift. So, I mean, are you using like a barbell for his deadlift? I started uh, elevated kettlebell. Yeah. So, okay. So again, Give him something that you like as far as the, the, the uh, rating of technique from your perspective, and then try to create some form of transitional activity. And, and so maybe you do something that's a little bit slower. So, hey, do a med ball slam in slow motion. Awesome. And then he starts to feel that. And then you say, you know what? I want you to take that slow motion kettlebell slam and I, I'm gonna have you hold on to this kettlebell and don't throw the kettlebell, but you know, perform the same pattern. And then maybe that's where he, he makes the connection in regards to the, uh, the, the pattern that you're looking for. So again, it's kind of the same strategy we've been talking about. It's like, okay, just find these small little wins, you know, the, and again, without having to, to try to come up with some magical activity to, to make the change, make small measurable adjustments. You know, what's the next logical step between your kettlebell deadlift and a medicine ball slam. Do something in slow motion, right? Yeah, you ever seen Lee Taft's fake throws? So maybe you do a fake throw, see how that looks, and then you slow the, the, the fake throw down, and then you transition that to your kettlebell, your hinging pattern, right? Awesome, that yeah. helps a ton. Yeah, that's, cool. that's really good. But don't don't try to guess what's going on with the guy. You know what I mean? Just just go with what you got. Go with what you visually see. Be a good person, right? Treat him nice. All right, dudes. I'm assuming it's all dudes, so I apologize if there's any females on the call I can't see. Hang on a minute. Nope, just us dudes. Okay, a lot of testosterone in the room tonight. We had a very, very good discussion. Thank you for all the great questions, you guys. Um, I am going to
go listen to something else for a little while and then I'm off to bed because I'm old now. All right. Thank you, Bill. You guys have a good night. Thanks, Lance.